evening to everyone. Um, with eight out of nine board members present, we'll call this meeting to order. And tonight, our moment of silence and pledge of allegiance will be led by Ms. Horn. Face the flag, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I see no elected officials in the audience tonight, and there's several other events going on. But if there should be one here, please raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Okay, then we'll go on into um, announcements, and this one is very important. Board members, just a reminder that you should have received an email link to your annual board evaluation survey several days ago. Please complete the survey no later than Friday, August 17th, so that we can have the results back in plenty of time for our annual workshop later in September. Finally, on behalf of the board, I want to say welcome back to all the students who attended school for the first half day of 2018-2019 school year. We hope you have a wonderful year and are honored to serve you and your families. And I know speaking as a former teacher, this is one of the most exciting days of the year. So uh, welcome back students and we welcome back the teachers last time. Um, any changes to the agenda? Ms. Owen. Madam Chair, I would like to add um, an agenda item to continue our discussion from last time regarding the kindergarten portfolio. So um, discussion and possible action on kindergarten portfolio. Okay. Any, Ms. Roundtree? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just gonna mention uh, we finished our, wrapped up our last work session so quickly that uh, we forgot about board forums. So. I was going to suggest adding that this evening in case any board member has news they'd like to share. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So there are two changes suggested to the agenda. One is adding the continued discussion of the portfolio with possible action. And the second is to add board forums since I closed the meeting without it last time. Okay, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Ms. Roundtree, seconded by Mr. Norman. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. We have several recognitions this evening, and for our first recognition, I would like to introduce Dr. Lyle Alshai. Dr. Alshai is the Deputy Commissioner for College, Career, and Technical Education and Teachers and Leaders at the Tennessee Department of Education, and he joins us this evening for a very special presentation. Dr. Alshai. Thank you, Madam Chairman and uh, fellow board members and Dr. Thomas. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And it's a particular pleasure to be able to give this award. Now, this is the second piece. You may know that uh, Ms. Franklin from West High School received the Milken Award earlier this year, and she got the important piece, which was her check then. Uh, but there's been a couple of scheduling conflicts, I think, in getting the obelisk to her. And uh, I wanted you to know and her to know that uh, I was determined to get, I think I came through the rain of the century, a flood, a couple of wrecks, and I parked in the wrong garage. And that, so, but it, well, it's here, and I'm here to, to deliver it tonight, one way or the other. So it is a pleasure to be here, and it's always fun to, to be able to recognize teachers. We, we know that. Uh, so I uh, have a few comments here, but let me say first, I got to meet Miss Franklin as, as just a few minutes before we started, and I'm already envious when I heard about the number of, uh, or the percentage of students at West High School that's in an IB program that she's a part of. Uh, you should be commended. Uh, I know how hard it is to start one of those and to maintain one of those. So I just want to throw that in as, as extra credit tonight because I love hearing great things going on in school systems. Okay, let me get to my script now. Ms. Paula Franklin of West High School uh, was one of 45 individuals that was named a Milken Educator for the 2017-18 school year. 
She did, as I said, receive her $25,000 cash prize back in November, but because of various circumstances, we haven't been able to get this obelisk to her. And uh, at that time, when she received her check, the Milken Family Foundation chairman and co-founder, Lowell Milken, and uh, Dr. McQueen, the Commissioner of Education, was they would surprise her and do that in front of her peers and students and, and other dignitaries and media to give her some extra attention there as well. Now this evening, we want to continue to recognize her by formally giving her this obelisk. And the Milken Awards, there's a quote that I really like in their awards program, and it says this. Uh, first of all, it's been recognized by the Teacher Magazine as the Oscars of Teaching. I think that's pretty good. And then it goes on to say that this has been uh, opening minds and shape, uh, opening minds and shaping futures for 30 years. Research shows, obviously, and we know this, that the quality of a good teacher cannot be underestimated and it's the number one in school factor for student success. And the Milken Fam Family Foundation rewards great teachers, thankfully. They seek to celebrate, elevate, and activate those innovators in classrooms. There are so many like Ms. Franklin, we're sure. One of the goals of the Milken Educator Award is to honor and reward outstanding K-12 educators for the quality of their teaching, their professional leadership. I think that's key. We talk a lot about uh, teacher leadership and their engagement with families and the community, as well as their potential for even greater contributions to the healthy development of children. I'm sure that everyone here already knows much more about Ms. Franklin's accolades and accomplishments than I do but it's a testimony to her commitment to the students of West High School and of Knox County. And I think we'll agree that from what I've already seen of her and her credentials and reading about her, my goodness, what a fine candidate and a recipient we have here tonight. She sets high expectations and demonstrates her own commitment to their success. She incorporates instructional practices such as simulations, cooperative learning projects, writing assignments, and even works to develop a historical basis as well as a critical analysis of our American democracy so they can be thinking, active, and engaged citizens. Her classroom is a trusted environment which encourages fairness for opinions to be freely expressed in her seminar-type discussions. Her hard work and expectations have paid off in addition to all the IB uh, numbers that I mentioned earlier. This is a, another remarkable number. 82% of her AP government students passed their AP exams with a score of 3.59, which is way beyond the national average of 50% and a score of 2.65. My goodness. Ms. Franklin is a teacher, a coach, and a role model for her students and peers. She has a knack for teaching others how to teach well. Don't we all wish that we could do that? She leads professional development sessions for gov uh, government teachers throughout the school system and mentors new teachers. And beyond academics, Ms. Franklin supports students in their extracurricular activities. I understand she does the prom and uh, also does cheerleading in her free time. And you know what? She's been here her whole career, right? She's a graduate of UTK. She's chosen to work here earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science with minor in, uh, in History and Secondary Education and a Master's in Secondary Education. Finally, I know that and believe fully that the state of Tennessee, the Knox County Schools, and West High School take pride in recognizing Ms. Paula Franklin's commitment to students, her peers, and her community. And on behalf of the Commissioner of Education and the Department of Education, it is a great pleasure to recognize Ms. Paula Franklin once again as a teacher at West High School and a 2017-18 Milken educator. If she could come forward, I could present you. Ms. Franklin, if you and Dr. Alshai and Ms. Fugit and the superintendent will come on up, we'll get a picture.
we have another special recognition tonight, and for that, I'll refer to Superintendent Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, the Tennessee Department of Education, in partnership with the Governor's Advisory Council for Alternative Education and the Tennessee Alternative Education Association, has established the Exemplary Practices in Alternative Education Recognition Program to recognize the efforts of districts who exemplify high-quality alternative education services. Two of our Knox County schools were recognized in June at the Tennessee Alternative Education Association Conference for the 2017-2018 school year and recognized as at the Tennessee Alternative Education Association Conference. And we just wanted to take a moment to share a little information about these two deserving programs and this honor. First of all, Richard Yokely School was one of the three schools in the state recognized as exemplary for alternative education. The school staff works diligently to provide a behavioral educational foundation that allows our students the opportunity to succeed in school and in life for grades 6 through 12. Their students receive standards-based instruction on core curriculum as well as career and technical education offerings and daily social skill lessons, while a school-wide behavioral management system allows opportunities for growth and reflection. You may, may recall that Richard Yokely was also one of the nine schools that piloted the Tiger evaluation model during the 2017-18 school year. And in the fall of 2017, the school established the first community PTSA in an alternative program in the state of Tennessee. Richard Yokely School is led by Principal Seth Smith. Please join me as we congratulate Seth and his staff. Seth, if you'll come forward, and you're going to be joined there by your board rep and the superintendent. And congratulations. Okay, our next uh, school I'd like to recognize, Ridgedale School. Um, Ridgedale was, was recognized as promise, promising practice school for significant progress toward high quality practices in alternative education. The school's mission is to foster supportive relationship in a safe, caring, and academically appropriate environment for students with special needs. Ultimately, their vision is to be a comprehensive, multidisciplinary school working to meet the, the academic, social, and emotional needs of individual students. Also, their program seeks to advance students' uh, academics and success, excuse me, through the effective use of research-based strategies. Uh, at this time, uh, Ridgedale School is led by Principal Diana Gossett. Please join me in congratulating Diana and her staff and Mr. Dorman.
Okay, board members and those in attendance tonight, I would ask your indulgence for just a few moments as we stray away from our agenda for just a bit. As most of you are aware, tonight is the last regularly scheduled meeting for three of our members, and I just wanted to take a moment to recognize them. Our current District 1 board member, Gloria Detheridge, has served since 2010. As the representative of our first district, Gloria cares about public education. Her work as an affiliate broker with Realty Executives has given her a knowledge of Knox County, and she has worked many hours during the last eight years engaging her community and helping our schools be the best they can be. She served as vice chair in 2013-14 and has served in multiple other board roles, including the Ethics Committee, the Disparities and Education Outcomes Steering Committee, the District Advisory Council, the Joint Education Task Force, the Redistricting Committee, and the Special Question Committee. Committee. Gloria has also served on the Project Grad Board of Directors and on the Tennessee School Board's Association Board of Directors. All of you who know Gloria well are, not, are also not surprised by her passion for our Tennessee Vols as she serves as a member of the University of Tennessee Lady Vols alumni program and as a University of Tennessee Chancellor's Associate. As part of the Leadership Knoxville Class of 2012, she is also a member of the Knoxville Chapter of the Links Incorporated and an active member of Mount Olive Baptist Church. Gloria's husband, Mark Dethridge, is here this evening, if he'll stand, and please help me express our sincerest appreciation to Ms. Dethridge for her service to our schools. So, Ms. Dethridge, if you'll come forward and get your plaque, and the rest of the board, we're going to have our picture made with Ms. Dethridge. I watch the superintendent run back and forth, and we're going to try to avoid that. So um, our, next, our current District 4 board member, Lynn Fugit, has also served since 2010. In addition to her official capacity as an elected board member, which includes serving as chair in 2013 and 14, Lynn works full-time as the chief executive officer of the Girl Scouts of the Southern Appalachians and previously as the senior vice president and market executive for Smart Bank, executive vice president of Capital Mart Bank and Trust, vice president of Clayton Bank and Trust, and vice president of First American National Bank. She was also the executive director of Nine Counties, One Vision, the largest citizen-driven long-range strategic planning effort in the southeastern United States. Lynn has served in multiple board roles, including the Ethics Committee, the Joint Education Task Force, the Knox County Investment Committee, the Redistricting Committee, the Review Committee for our board's core values and mission statement, the Superintendent's Evaluation Committee, and the Teacher Survey Issue Committee. She also served on the Tennessee School Board's Association Board of Directors and as the board's Tennessee Legislative Network representative. Lynn's dedication to students does not stop at the K-12 level as she graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1983 with a degree in finance 
and is still involved with the National Leadership Honor Society Omicron Delta Kappa Mortar Board and Alpha Chi Omega Sorority. Lynn's husband, Scott, is here this evening, I believe, so if he'll please stand. <laughs> and I'll join the rest of the board. Our current District 9 board member, Amber Roundtree, was elected to the board in 2014. She, in just four short years, she has served as board vice chair for the last two years and also spent an untold number of hours chairing the superintendent search committee in 2016 and 17. In addition, during these last four years, Amber has served on the ethics committee, the Family Advisory Council and as the board's representative to the Knox County Schools PTA Clothing Center and the Disparities in Educational Outcomes Task Force. As her district's representative, she worked diligently with community stakeholders and Knox County School staff on a rezoning plan that allowed children to attend schools closer to their homes and the expansion of community schools. As a librarian, Amber actively participated in the renovation plans for the South Little High School Media Center, and she accomplished all of this while working toward finishing up her doctoral degree in education at the University of Tennessee. Amber currently has two sons, Teddy and Hope, who will soon become Knox County School students, and so we look forward to many more years of her involvement and participation as a parent. I think Bart and Teddy are, and Hope are here this evening, so if they'll stand and once again, We'll get our picture made with Okay, Ms. Coatney. Item seven, consent agenda. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Okay, Mr. Norman, do I have a second? Mr. McMillan, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. 8A, approve application and receipt of funds for a 21st Century Community Learning Center's grant from the Tennessee Department of Education in the amount of $323,989 for after-school programming at Kristenberry and Pongap Elementary Schools. So moved. Second. 
Motion by Ms. Owen, seconded by Mr. Norman. Is there any discussion on this item? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 8B, approve additional allocation in the amount of $48,510 from the Tennessee Department of Education for Special Education Services for fiscal year 2019. Motion by Mr. Norman. Yeah. Second by Ms. Roundtree. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 8C, approve application and receipt of funds for competency-based education mini-grants from the Tennessee Department of Education in the total amount of $30,000 to pilot competency-based education plans at Gibbs Middle School, Gibbs High School, and the Ellen and STEM Academy. Second. Okay, motion by Ms. Etheridge, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 8D, approve application and receipt of funds for an immigrant grant from the Tennessee Department of Education in the amount of $24,020 for supplemental services to immigrant families. Second. second. Motion by Mr. Norman, second was by Ms. Roundtree. We'll just, okay, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 8E, approved donation agreement with TAP Water Watch for donation of a new LK Easy H2O bottle filling station with an approximate value of $1,000 for student, staff, and public use at Central High School. So moved. Second. Motion, motion made by Ms. Owen, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 9A, approve contracts with Sign Co. Incorporated and Sycamore Sign Service, LLP, to provide electronic sign installation and repair services for the term of August 2018 through July 2019, which may be extended for four additional years, one year at a time, for a total of five years. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Roundtree, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 9B, approve contract with Delta Dental of Tennessee for administration of the Knox County Schools Employee Dental Insurance Benefit Services for the period of January 1, 2019 through December 31, 2020, which may be extended for one additional year for a total of three years. Second. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 9C, approve contract with IMED Vision Care LLC for administration of the Knox County Schools Employee Vision Insurance Benefit Services for the period of January 1, 2019 through December 31, 2020, which may be extended for one additional year for a total of three years. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9D, approve agreement with Instructure Incorporated for Canvas Cloud subscription plus additional storage and support for the 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020 school years at a cost of $585,593.57 per TCPN contract R150702. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Owen. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 9E, approve amendments to contracts with Eminem Productions USA and Pac-Man Sports Productions Incorporated for broadcasting rights to Knox County Schools events. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 10A, discussion and possible action on recruitment incentives up to $24,000 for newly hired certified employees working toward a special education licensure using general purpose tuition reimbursement funds. Motion by Ms. Etheridge, seconded by Mr. Norman. Ms. Oh. oh, it's just discussion. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fugit will Thank we'll recognize you. you then. I apologize. Thank you. That's okay. Um, Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion to approve the recruitment incentives for newly hired, newly hired certified employees pursuing a special education endorsement up to $24,000 using tuition reimbursement funding and requiring a three-year employment commitment to Knox County Schools as outlined, as outlined in the attached memo um, that is on our agenda. Second. 
Seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Fugit on the floor, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Is there any discussion now on this item? Okay, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. TNB discussion and possible action on the 2018 through 2021 strategic plan. So moved. Okay. Are you yes, making, a motion? making a motion for discussion at this and point. I will, and I will get, second her motion to uh, adopt the strategic plan so that we can have discussion. Okay. So you got that, Ms. Clay. Okay. So any discussion on the strategic plan? Okay, we have, Ms. Roundtree, we have a couple of speakers. Will they get on the strategic plan? Our first speaker is Susan Swan. Ms. Swan. Thank you, Susan Swan, Knox County resident. I'm requesting a postponement of the strategic plan to give the community more time to address the deficits. I am speaking on the strategic plan. Why am I here? I am here due to my past previous questions on how the coupon book money was spent. I was not satisfied with the answer I received. Since my initial inquiry about two years ago, I've been informed that Knox County has a new computer system in place with standalone data center that is currently being programmed as fast as any humans could. Kudos. Knox County also uses the state accounting model for the audit. That annual audit is extremely difficult for me to digest. I believe that I have plenty of company trying to understand the previous annual audit of $454 million. I can't look behind, but I can look forward. I can request improvements. Quote, where there's a will, there's a way. This saying is used to mean that if you're determined enough, you can find a way to achieve whatever you want, even if it's difficult. The same as saying is also useful to describe the foxes trying to get in the hen house. As much as it is the responsibility of our present strategic plan to add meaningful, obtainable, monitored, transparent, easily accessible, easy to understand financial data upon request, which Knox County should be able to pull up with a few keystrokes. I do understand that in order to, for Knox County to be able to pull up its expenditures, especially to the penny, our new computer program must be programmed on the front end. If we don't program on the front end, Knox County cannot produce the requested data on expenditures. In, regarded, in regard to fundraisers, sponsorships, donations, with one number going in and one number going out with, as in professional bookkeeping practices, the computer age has arrived in Knox County. We now have the full ability to create data to improve how Knox County spends its money. 484 $0.5 million does have potential to be a challenge in full accountability and transparency. Change is hard. But I feel certain that Knox County is up to the challenge, especially since we want Knox County to be the best school system in the South. It can be done. It can't be done overnight and will initially require more software computer programmers. Any money spent on programmers will save all that money down the road. All money spent on training staff from central office to bookkeepers at each school will improve efficiency with the left hand knowing what the right hand is doing. Our new computer system has unlimited potential to track our money down to the last penny. Knox County has a silver bullet, a newly discovered antibiotic at its disposal to improve their ability to keep more foxes out of the hen house. Just like the teachers put in long extra hours 
in data analysis, waste analysis, collecting data, many hours ongoing in order to improve their performance. So can our financial department learn lessons from our teachers. As a taxpayer, I expect no less than exemplary. I'm requesting more concrete, measurable, accounting, transparently, transparent, easily understood monitoring objectives and benchmarks with a projected timeline so taxpayers can see these wonderful improvements in practicing good financial stewardship for our greater, better good of our students. When you make a sandwich and you leave out the meat, the sandwich is not so good. I see that the extremely valuable resource of Knox County teachers' input well-being working in a non-hostile environment, nurtured in a positive teaching culture, not being bullied, not being afraid to speak up out of fear for losing their jobs is absent from this plan. I'm requesting that measurable goals and concrete objectives with timelines be added to this plan to address these issues. Help, 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 and help the teachers in this important strategic plan so they will remain and stay with Knox County. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Swan. Our next speaker is Todd Shelton. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, with the exception of bus routes, most students' school day begins in the classroom and ends in the classroom. All of the goals we set and the methodology we decide to use have to go through the classroom teacher and special skill teachers. My understanding is that we have plenty of classes with over 20 students and some with over 30. When one teacher has to teach 20 plus students all day, all year, even the talented and gifted teachers will have more bad days than good. Unless you're Ms. Franklin, apparently. So congratulations to her. A bad day could be when students need a little extra attention because some of some bad circumstance and doesn't get it. Or a student that got bullied on the bus or in the bathroom and tried to ask for help but didn't get it. Or a student who was ready to move on to the next chapter but was given busy work while the teacher helped the other kids catch up. Or a student acting totally out of character all class long, but there was no time for the classroom teacher to investigate. The strategic plan draft should show that steps are being taken and that the plan includes looking at studies and results of what happens in classes with lower student-teacher ratios. The plan should show that the district is looking at teacher and staff compensation practices and what effect it has on long-term employment and success in the classroom. It appears to a lot of people that the Knox County school budget is out of date and insufficient. At the same time, the life of the students have become more demanding both academically and socially. Unfortunately, our students face some real scary possibilities at a time they should be discovering, experimenting, and problem solving. This last April gave us a hint of the financial crisis we are in with no accredited or classified staff getting a raise to try to keep up with inflation. While all the other civil workers in Knoxville and Knox County did receive raises, our strategic plan barely mentioned staff compensation. I saw no intentions to look at studies about student-teacher ratios and to analyze the repercussions of lower or raising student-teacher ratios. I saw little mention of exploring hiring more special teachers and social workers to support the classroom teachers' work. The strategic plan should have goals that work and should deal with what the cost will be. This should be transparent and shared with the, com with the community by November, not February, right before the vote for a new budget comes up. We should be hearing about the need to increase funding for our system 
and not by dismantling programs for the challenged student or the gifted student that are serving their intended purpose. These are some reasons that I think the strategic plan should be discussed more before finalizing it. Please do not rush to pass this draft. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes public forum on this item. Thank you. Ms. Horn. Oh, okay. Ms. Ellen, we'll come to you first and then Ms. Horn. As I sat down with teacher after teacher this week, it became obvious that there is no conceivable way that teacher error could be solely blamed for the problems we are seeing with the portfolio. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were confusing me, Ms. Owen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll That's come okay. Back to that in a minute. You, okay. You want to speak to the strategic yes. plan? Okay. Thank you. I have quite a lot of stress over both of these, so. I understand. Um, let's write a piece of paper down. As we ask for names of people who were interviewed for our strategic plan, it struck me that these were given to us not as a list of people who were involved, but instead their comments with their names redacted. And the comments went along with the exact same questions that were asked in our community meetings, which are also the exact same questions that were available online. So I'm very concerned that we spent a great deal of staff time going out to 28 people Yes, there are just 26 on the list you have in your email, but there were 28 people. And taking time to sit down with those 28 people and ask them to give feedback that could have been given online, that could have been given in community meetings. Many of the folks that are listed here are government officials who could have easily attended those community meetings and given that feedback there. However, those are not my largest concerns. My largest concern about the list of people is that when it was finally given to the board, it doesn't contain all of the names. There are two names missing. Also, um, under local government, we include people who were running in primaries at the time but were not part of local government. And I think it's very important to note that three of our mayoral candidates were interviewed and two were not. So we had the three male candidates interviewed, the two female candidates were not interviewed. It just also happens that also breaks down by party. However that may have happened, um, is not as concerning as that it did. Two of those people, I wouldn't have thought twice about if I'd seen them on the list because they currently serve in office. But one of them does not. And so it concerns me that we made quite an assumption about that person's potential in that race, whether or not it turned out that way I don't think we should be interviewing political candidates for a strategic plan for the Board of Education and our district unless we include every person running for political office. So that is the largest concern to me. I would like to have all of their comments taken out and removed from any consideration in our strategic plan. Beyond that, um, what we have are, are pages of mismatched information, pages that frankly look like several different departments did different work without ever having a discussion with each other. As a strategic plan for this district, it's unacceptable. The only way I would consider voting for this is if we very specifically said that we are voting on it only as a draft, which will be continued in a large meeting with all of our board members. That's the only way I would even consider this to have potential for us to work on. When we say that it's a living document, yes, it does change over time, 
but that time is expected to be three years from now. So it doesn't live the same way our procedures and policies live. So if we're going to adopt a strategic plan, it needs to be a complete strategic plan when it's adopted. If this is going to be considered as a first draft and accepted as a very first draft with a huge amount of work to be done, I think that's the only way it can be considered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go over to Ms. Horn. Yes, Ms. Fugit would like to respond to that, and then I can. Okay. Thank you. I, I would, Madam Chair. I'd like to respond to Ms. Owens' comments about why people okay. were asked to speak. Um, in all the years I've done strategic plan, and back when we did nine counties, one vision, and back when um, every plan I've been involved in, it was customary to invite every person running for political office who might have something to do with the plan once it was in place to get their feedback. Everyone was asked. I, I, can't, res I can't respond to who chose to, um, who chose to respond or not. I did not ask. All I'm saying is that that was the thinking behind it. There was, noth there was nothing nefarious behind it. Um, I suspect most of the people doing the interviewing were not of the political party of the people that were interviewed. I don't know that, but it really doesn't matter. That's one of the sad things that we've come to is that we, we now worry so much about party. It was really just trying to talk to people who might be a mayor when this plan was being executed because it would have financial ramifications. If you want to disqualify their comments, that's fine. I don't think any of those things change dramatically what people said they wanted. It was more a courtesy to speak to elected officials who often don't come to public meetings to, because of other commitments that they have. That was the only reason that was done. If you want to throw out all their comments, you can throw out all their comments. I am not going to sit here and um, on my last meeting demand that the board have a strategic plan. I did what this board asked me to do. This board asked me to put together a process like I had done in the past to do a strategic plan. If people don't like the, the measurements and what's evaluated, it's up to board members to make recommendations. We can't just keep coming here month after month telling the, telling the staff who wrote it, we don't like it unless we tell them what we do want in it. Um, we didn't hire an outside consultant. We had staff write this. You're absolutely right. I'm sure it was departments putting stuff together. Maybe it's not ready, but I think what concerns me a little bit about the tone I'm hearing in some of your questions is that you think there's some nefarious something going on about this plan. If you don't wanna have this plan, vote it down, start over, do a, you know, work on this plan. That's, that's all I'm saying is that there's nothing ill will in here and if we don't like what's being measured, it's the, up to the board to tell the staff what we want measured. We can't just expect staff to come to these meetings and hear we don't like this without any direction on what we do want to measure. Thank you, Ms. Fugit. Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think that um, we do need to have a board session to discuss this plan. I, I think that um, it can be more focused and there are some things that are missing that we need to have included. So I think it's just not ready and there, there are some improvements that we can make. And um, so whether we want to move that to a committee or if we want to schedule and a time when we can um, collaborate on what we would like to see so that we are giving that direction to the staff. Um, but I think that we, I think we need to spend um, a dedicated time frame as a, as a board discussing what we want to see in here because I know I have specific things that I would like to see and I would say some of you would concur, but we need to be able to discuss that. So if we can just talk about perhaps what that process may look like. Thank you, Ms. Round. You decided. Okay. 
then I'll go to Ms. Detheridge and then I'll come to you, Ms. Owen, after she's had a chance to speak. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I guess I was gonna say, if that's the case, then that's where you have a retreat. And if that's what you wanna do is go back and, and start over or uh, massage it a little bit more and give you input, then that's where you do that. Um, I'd just like to know how many board members responded to, to suggestions and, and making changes to this in the past eight weeks? How many? Just a few. What's the question? I mean, can no, I are we not? taking a poll? Are we raising our hands? No. <laughs> we just, I, I mean, I guess I need to ask, not you, but i uh, ask uh, Mr. John Rizer, because I'm Mr. Uh, uh, Clifford Davis. I mean, everybody how many responded. did you read? Dr. Did Davis. everybody respond to this? Because we've been, it's been out here, and I'm, I'm just saying, we've had opportunity to respond. Now we want to get together as a whole board and talk about it. So I'm just asking. We, we did have responses from board members about Thanks. things that they wanted to see. We okay. made those um, okay. adjustments in the plan that's currently before you. Okay, so we have already had input into this. So my guess, my question is, it's not reflecting what we already want, or is it we need to look at it again? And that's just a question we have to decide. Um, but we can go. I won't be here. I'm like Miss Fugit. I won't be here, and neither will Miss Roundtree to even help massage it anymore. But we can massage it all you want to. It's a plan. It's a guideline that you give to your superintendent that's what you want to do for the next three years. Measurements in it. You want to look at it, change it. But my thing is, we can meet. You can talk about it. You can do a retreat on it. You can do whatever you want to. But if you've already submitted your suggestions and there are, have been reflected, I don't know how many more you're going to have to do in order to make it what you want it to be. But like I said, I won't be here to worry about it anyway. But this board needs to decide which direction we want to go in and which way we're going to go in. And at the same time, make those kind of, of changes. And and when, you, when, when I hear people say well, we don't have, we're not taking about to think about the teachers, we're not thinking about, we have an MOU with the teachers. We're not talking about, we have guidelines, procedures, disparity studies. We have a lot of things that do, if, does it have to be to that level in the strategic plan. When we, get, we have policies, we have procedures. This is a guideline. We have measurements. Every year they're going to go back and you're going to look at the measurements and you're going to see how you're, going, how you're doing and you're going to adjust it. You're going to change it. It's a plan. And I, I guess my, I don't know how many people have been involved in strategic plans. I personally have been involved with a few. I don't know how many people have been on the board. I've been on quite a few. But it seems like we just get outside our lane a lot. We try to do the, the central office staff and the superintendent's job a lot. Sometimes we have to stay in our lane and let them do their job. If we want to do this, then maybe we need to go and, and ask the superintendent to hire us. But at the same time, this is a guideline. This is a plan. And let's just figure out what we want in it, make those changes, and move on. Now, that's for the future board and whoever sits in the seat next month. Thank you, Ms. Dethridge. Ms. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the comments that have been made. Uh, Ms. Fugit, I don't want you going off this board feeling sour that you weren't appreciated for pulling this together and, and trying because it, it... I feel appreciated. I felt my integrity question. Gotcha. Well, I, I regret that you feel that. Um, that certainly is not is not shared by by all board members. Um, and the comments about, about who, was, who was talked to on this plan and whether it was elected officials or people that were running for office or w whatever that list might look like, what's, what's really regretful to me in this whole thing is that, you know, we did put this out there almost a year early we did have meetings asking people what they wanted in this plan. Um, you know, regretfully or for whatever reason, the people that were interviewed, um, and since I didn't go to every meeting, I don't know for sure who was or wasn't there, but I did go to two of them. Um, these, these people did not respond during public meetings. I, I commend the um, staff for going out and taking the time to try to get uh, input from some elected officials and those that 
uh, stepped up to be willing to even run for office because everyone up here knows that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so the, the idea that people have not had a chance to give their input is just incorrect. It's just incorrect. It was put out there. And, you know, I think even if we tried to do another round of meetings, we probably would not have any more participation than we've had to this point. I mean, I don't know that for certain, but just given my history on the board for the last four years with trying to get community involvement and public input, it has been very poor to say, uh, to be kind about it. It's been, it's been very poor. So to Mrs. Deathridge's point about, um, you know, we can, we can go, go on and on, but at some point we have got to make a decision. You know, if it's the board's will, maybe we need to have a special call meeting and do nothing but discuss this because we seem to have a difficult time during board meetings wanting to, um, uh, to take the time that's required, and I get that. We've got a lot of other things going on. Um, to some of the comments, though, that were made about what the plan is lacking uh, regarding class size and teacher compensation, um, we have talked about teacher compensation and, and class size and the, uh, the benefits of smaller classes this is not a secret, and and the fact of the matter is, it's it has been addressed in in class size with some of our our um, uh, lower performing schools. They do have class sizes half what other uh, other schools that have not scored so uh, so low on testing. Have I mean it isn't like we have not looked at class sizes and the benefits. It is not like we have not looked at teacher compensation and don't recognize that I think we are what 29th in the state and know that 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 this is that this is not good for Knox County. These things have been looked at. They have been addressed. They continue to be mentioned in the strategic plan and. And, and compensation is not something that has been ignored. It might appear that it's been ignored because this board has not been able to do what everyone up here would like to have done and, and been able to offer more compensation. But again, a strategic plan, it is not a, 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 a written in gold document. It is merely a roadmap for where we need to try to go. I struggle with, with some attitudes that it needs to be so final, it, that it needs to be so, um, this is what, what we will do in a three year period of time. Um, it, 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 it is a roadmap. And as <laughs> Ms. Fugit, God love you, said a hundred times, it is fluid. Uh, I think we make a real mistake um, trying to go for too much um, uh, finality uh, in this. Having said that, do I agree that it probably needs to be cleaned up? Absolutely, I do. Um, uh, do I feel like this board, if we want to do this, we need to make more of a commitment to have the meeting and get this done and not keep putting it back on our staff over and over again? Uh, this is this is not fair to them, and it's really not fair to the community. It's been out there. The community has had a chance to let us know what they want in it. This board has had a chance to state what we want in it. Lack of participation from top to bottom uh, becomes an issue, honestly, bigger than us. So uh, I do support perhaps a, a, a special called meeting to to discuss this and come up with some finality, um, uh, but again, we, we do need to pick a plan, and I hope we can make one tonight, to have some uh, finality in all of this. 
we, we could do this for the next six months. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, two separate things throw out for consideration the idea of passing in draft form just the summary document that's shorter. I see Ms. Fugit nodding in agreement to that. <laughs> and I guess my other question is, um, as some of my colleagues have said, we are going off the board, but I do have a concern given um, the fact that it's the beginning of the school year and the amount of time that the staff has put in. And I think that um, as far as our curricular needs and serving our our children in our schools, I'm just concerned about, you know, I guess to Ms. Hill's point, so what is the plan gonna be? Is it gonna be continued to just go back to Dr. Davis and Dr. Reiswick and say, okay, we want this massaged more? I, I'm just, and I don't wanna put these gentlemen on the spot and say, how much time have you spent? But um, I will use Ms. Massey because I know she already left. <laughs> Y'all can, <laughs> I know that, um, Particularly we have, um, as we voted on earlier, we have a gap to fill in our SPED. And so I'm thinking about how much work she and her department and our, our SPED facilitators and our SPED teachers have on their plates. Um, the caseload's going up. I don't know that, for example, it's the most beneficial use of that department's time to come back and spend 10 more hours wordsmithing this I don't you know when we have when we have empty classrooms without teachers I mean I think we have I guess you know we might have bigger fish to fry and that's not to say that the strategic plan is unimportant I just if we aren't happy as a board with the language or the verbiage that the staff has used then <laughs> the suggestion of a committee who, who is going to put in the time and actually sit down and edit the document because I, I fear that um, kicking it back to Dr. Davis and then all the subsequent departments is at this time in the school year not the best use of their time given our current needs. So I'll just leave it at that. And I, and I will say, um, you know, as someone that attended the strategic plan meeting and plan to attend in the future and will be a future Knox County parent. Um, and I have heard this from community members. There is an, an issue when we hold meetings and then no action is taken. So I think that is something we have to think about as well. We have low participation. What could be the root cause of that? I mean, I, know, I feel like the people that were at the meeting at South Doyle gave really great detailed input. And so are we saying now that that is inadequate, we need more input. I, I'm just, I brought that up at our last meeting. How, how are we gonna seek to engage people in a more authentic or different way? Thank you. Did you wish to make a substitute motion? Yes, I'll make a substitute motion that the board approve as a first draft the strategic plan summary document, which is the two page document and then should I add something about, then you all can have a special called meeting to I'll wordsmith it. Make a motion for the document. And yeah. Okay, then we can discuss. So I'm just gonna make, I'm gonna re-amend my amended motion um, that we approve as a first draft the strategic plan summary document. And that's a substitute motion. Yes. yes. And, oh, is that a substitute? Oh, is that a substitute? Second. Okay. Then Ms. Dugit seconds it, so. Any discussion on the substitute motion? Do you wish to speak, Ms. Owen? I would like to respond to some earlier comments, if I could, that I've not had an opportunity to respond to. Who wants to respond to me? Is there a comment? Should we go to the other comments on the substitute first? <laughs> I'm sorry, what, Ms. Detheridge? Okay, yes. Ms. Detheridge has a question about the motion, Ms. Roundtree. Your mics, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, we're talking about approving the just the two-page summary as yes. a draft. Yes. And not anything else at this, at this point. At this point, yes, ma'am. Which means it's not final either. It's just something. Like yes. It. Okay. Okay. Ms. Owen, go ahead, Ola. Do you have a comment on the substitute motion? 
I do, and simply because I think that we can do that, but I think we still need some follow to discuss what the follow-up will be after that. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, Ms. Owen. I, I would like to agree with Ms. Hill that this should not be on our staff. We should not be spending hours and hours and hours of staff time. And we had one staff member who interviewed all of those 28 people. That's not a good use of that person's time, especially when that person is a talent and acquisition specialist at the time of year when we need to be hiring staff. That's problematic. Um, if we are going to call this the board's plan, it needs to be the board's plan. If we are going to have the staff do it, the staff needs to do it. There's nothing that I said to indicate that there was anything nefarious in what was done. I think it was bad. I don't think it was nefarious. If I thought it was nefarious, I'd say so. I would say so very clearly. The problem I have is that when I have requested this information, the answers I'm getting don't match up. The, my request for information when I ask specifically how, how these interviewees were selected, the word candidate is nowhere, nowhere here at all. And so I have no way to know that information because it wasn't included in the plan. It wasn't disclosed at any step in the process. And when I requested information from, from the administration, I did not get that answer. So I have no way to know that. All I can do is look at a list of people, which I had a hard time getting, and try to glean how they came to be part of that list. So if, if we, Whatever we do, if we are going to be transparent at all, we need to put all of the information available out there so that everyone is very clear with exactly what we are doing and exactly how these decisions were made. It's not to say that anything nefarious was done. It's to say that it's unclear, that it's confusing, and that nobody up here really knows the answers to a lot of these questions that we're asking. And that's a problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want okay. to respond and then I'm going to call the question. Okay. Because she's. Yes. Okay. Ms. Owen, I really wish that the times I had made reports to the board, someone had asked me what, what this was. I should have been more detailed and told you all this stuff. I'd made reports, talked about interviewing people. I apologize if you feel like that you weren't given enough information. I did not know you were asking for that information. I would have been happy to give it to you myself. But with that, Madam Chair, I call for the question. We need to vote on are we accepting this two-page summary or not. Thank you, Ms. Fugit and Ms. Coatney. I've asked her to read this substitute motion that was made by Ms. Roundtree and seconded by you. Don't you ever have a two-third vote to, to call for yeah, the question? because okay. Mike had his light on. I'm sorry. Chris okay. Asked a question. Oh, I'm fine. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just well, wondered. we have to approve well, calling for the question. Approved, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, since this is just a draft, and at least since I've been here, we've never done it this way, but that doesn't mean that, that it's wrong necessarily or, or there's anything wrong with that. But in the past, I believe that we have uh, voted on the actual plan twice. Is that not right, Ms. Fugit? Since you, we've been here the same amount of time. Oh, I guess my question is, I guess since this is a draft, it only requires one vote if it passes. But can anybody tell me if the, once we put a plan actual plan in place that will it require two readings or one reading? Mr. Dukla. Um, that's, that's a good question, Mr. McMillan. I, I mean, I've not, I've not researched that. I mean, you know, this is, but, but a plan is, is, is akin to a policy decision. Uh, so, um, without, without doing some further research, which I will, um, Two two readings would be would certainly be proper since since all of the board's policies do do require two readings, uh, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Okay. Now we're voting. 
one, one more question. Miss um, Dethridge. Why are we approving a draft anyway? I'm just asking. I mean, it's a draft. I'm like Mike. <laughs> it's a draft. It's not the final. Why are we going through this motion to approve a draft? Well, it's a motion now, a substitute motion that we will need to vote on. You can vote yes or no. I get that, but my point is you, a, don't, a you, don't, you don't approve a draft. I mean, you can, but go. Mr. Mr. What? If you would like to, sure. I think we should. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Cotney, would you read the substitute motion yes, made sir. by Ms. Roundtree and seconded by Ms. Fugit, and then we'll do a roll call vote starting with District 1. Okay. The substitute motion is to approve as a first draft the strategic plan summary document. Ms. Jeffridge? Ms. Owen? No, it's a plan. Clarification, a did that include future work in the, in the original motion? Or is it just to accept it as a draft? It's, I, my motion I was, was just to accept it as a draft. No. Mr. Norman? Yes. Ms. Fugit? Yes. Ms. Horn? No. Ms. Hill? Yes. Mr. McMillan? No. Ms. Roundtree? Yes. Ms. Bounds? Yes. That's five yes votes and four no votes. I see all these lights on. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Okay, so five yes. It passes. That was the substitute motion. Ms. Roundtree. And I was just going to open the floor up now. I think Ms. Horn's idea of either setting a meeting or Ms. Hills or having a committee to to further solidify the plan would be a good idea for the board to discuss at this point. Thank you, Ms. Roundtree. Mr. Dupler, before the board begins to discuss it, do you have any recommendations on that or any opinion? Is, is Ms. Roundtree making a motion? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was making a, a, just for discussion purposes. I mean, I don't think that, I, I personally don't think that Lynn and Gloria or I should be deciding when the well, the, what the next step should be, but the law director's position would be that a that a motion and a second needs to be made if if the board's going to discuss it. Okay, I make a motion to discuss the next steps for the strategic plan. Second. Discussion and possible action. Sorry. Second. Okay, that. and seconded by Ms. Horn. So now we can have discussion. Ms. Fugit, do you want Thank to read you. out? Um, yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a substitute motion. That, that this be um, put on the board's uh, retreat agenda to figure this out. I accept. For a second. <laughs> it's called passing the buck. Okay. So we have a substitute motion. Mr. Dupler. I made a substitute motion. Amber seconded it. So we are voting on a substitute motion to That's put this on topic the on the board's retreat agenda to discuss how they want to move forward with the strategic plan. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fugit. So, so the board will need to vote on the substitute motion, and if the substitute motion passes, then the then the issue's done. If if the substitute motion does not pass, then you go back to the original. Is there any discussion on that? Yes, Ms. Hill. Uh, just as a matter of procedure. Uh, Mr. Dupler, is is um, uh, is a new board uh, bound by a decision made by an old board on what should be on the new board's agenda for a retreat? Thank you, Ms. Hill. Uh, a new board is not it is not bound in the way that it votes on on issues. Uh, uh, you, you, this board can go ahead and set an agenda for a retreat, uh, but but certainly before that retreat comes, you know, a new board could could make a decision to uh, tweak that agenda, take it off, amend it, what what have you. So so this board cannot cannot bind a future board in that manner. Okay. 
So we have the substitute. Uh, we have the substitute motion. Okay. So all in favor of the substitute motion made by Ms. Roundtree and seconded by Ms. Horn to take this up at the board retreat. Made by Lynn, seconded by Ms. Horn. Oh, Ms. I know. How could y'all make it any more difficult? I'll meet. I want to go out with your. <laughs> I, I'm beginning to think that, Ms. Dugan. Okay. So, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. Motion carries. <laughs> Item 10C, discussion and possible action on kindergarten portfolios. Okay. Ms. Owen, then Ms. Roundtree. Right. Now I'm in. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, yes, we'll have to have. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if Ms. Owen wants to go ahead and speak, but there is, I guess you're going to reference Ms. Patchett. She signed up to um, speak. So okay, go gonna, ahead, Ms. Hopefully Owen. I'll, hopefully, I'll get her in here. So, if Ms. Patchett would like to be ready, um, this is what I'm really wadded up about here. So, <laughs> it is all that I have thought about for several days after I sat down with teachers in my district and a process that I've seen and a process that I understood made absolutely no sense. Don't, don't be this ready. I'm going to talk for just a second. <laughs> um, there's no way our teachers can be solely blamed for the problems that went on, having seen the evidence that I've seen. And I hope every board member before Friday, because there's a deadline attached that I'll explain in a minute, I hope every board member can go and sit down with a kindergarten teacher and look at their portfolio. Even those kindergarten teachers who feel like they had no problems, if you really talk to them, 100% of the teachers I talked to had some kind of major problem with their portfolio. That's not teacher error. This information should have been reported to the board last week, but instead we received that canned answer that the state has given over and over. As a board, we expect to be supplied with the most accurate information available so that we can make good decisions. We expect it to be from reliable sources, and that's not what happened last week. This information was not only extraordinarily incomplete, but some of it was simply not true. Our State Department of Education has difficulty accepting accountability, and we know that. We also know that we hold ourselves in our district to a higher standard, and we expect full disclosure of all available information for us to be able to function as a board. When we don't get complete, accurate, reliable information from our staff, it's detrimental to our ability to do our job. I should not need to spend hours on hours gathering information from teachers. Their supervisors should already know this information and they should have shared it with us. If we're not getting that information, I would strongly encourage our superintendent to deal with that however necessary to ensure it doesn't happen again. Last year, kindergarten teachers across the state were required to use the portfolio system for 35% of their evaluation. This was passed by our Tennessee State House unanimously and by our Senate with only three dissenting. This was a plan that almost all of our legislators could agree on to support teachers and do the right thing for students. That is huge. They never agree. <laughs> and unanimously in the House, it's almost unheard of. Though Knox County Schools had piloted a portfolio for arts teachers in 2013 that I was also part of, followed later by a K-2 pilot that that vetted platform that we used is not the platform the state provided for our kindergarten teachers this year. Instead, they chose a new, untested, unfamiliar platform, which they announced very late with training even later. Teachers were given bad information, untimely information throughout the process. Teachers at high motility schools were at an immediate disadvantage because they had fewer students to draw from. And it's important to understand how that works. If you have 20 students at the beginning of the year, 10 move out, 10 move in. The only students you can use for data are the 10 that were there originally and that are still there at the end of the year. That's all you have for data. 
The state <laughs> kept changing the rules, releasing new rubrics after teachers had already collected evidence. Districts across the state provided inconsistent training and misinformation to their teachers. And teachers spent hours creating these portfolios to match developmentally inappropriate rubrics that ask five-year-olds to perform tasks far beyond what they should be doing in kindergarten. It's also important to note that if you look at the rubric the teacher was given and you look at the rubric the evaluators were given, they're not the same. So the person scoring their work has completely different guidelines from the person submitting the work. That's ridiculous. The state missed two deadlines to return scores and feedback. And again, I hope every board member takes time to look at the completely worthless feedback that our teachers have been given. What they have is a list of possible options of things that they might have done wrong. It has nothing to do with the actual work that they turned in. Then late on June 25th, teachers finally received scores, but many of their submissions had never been scored, resulting in an automatic lowest score of one. And when we open up the report, what it shows is that no reviewer even looked at the file. There's no feedback, but we can see that the questioned item was never even escalated to another reviewer as protocol requires. The state then released a document stating that the only reason a portfolio would appear to be unscored would be teacher error. When teachers sent emails, the response from districts and from the state was either to resend that same email from the state or to send them somewhere else. The state pointed to districts, the districts pointed to the state, and everybody said it's the teacher's fault, it's the teacher's fault. And I want to break from this narrative to ask how this possibly makes any sense at all. If I told a student that I had decided to grade three of his four assignments and that all four will still make up his, his average, but I'm going to give that ungraded one 20%, I don't think there is a person anywhere who would back me up on that. No one is going to tell me that makes sense. Yet we have been here allowing our Department of Education to do exactly that. I can't imagine refusing to give feedback or an explanation of a score to any student. I can't imagine refusing to help or even acknowledge a struggling student. But this is exactly the response from our State Department of Ed and even from our own Knox County Administration, according to 100% of the teachers I've talked to. In other words, we have a 100% failure rate in responding to our teachers' concerns, in helping our teachers grow, in making our teachers feel valued, and in building a positive culture <laughs> regarding the kindergarten portfolios. We all know that a high rate of failure in a test generally means that the measure was flawed. The Department of Education has to know this as well. But in an award-winning display of butt covering, the Tennessee Department of Education announced that there would no longer be access to the data after August 10th. That's why you need to go see it by Friday, because they actually intend to erase all of that evidence that all of our teachers have put into the system, along with any way of proving the teacher did nothing wrong. All of their collections will be gone they have been told after August 10th. Today I was told that there actually is a way to download and save files, and that is going to be a surprise to all those teachers I've talked with. I was told there is a way to download and save files, but oddly our teachers have been told the opposite. Why would the Department of Education keep this information from our teachers? Most of them have been told that the only way to keep their files is to go through a tedious process of taking screenshots of every collection at least 24 evidence collections and the 24 cover pages teachers had to write to accompany each one. When I heard teachers saying, oh, but we had to write a page to go with each of our collections, in my mind, I was thinking, okay, four sets, four pages, okay, no. They had to write 24 sets because they had to have that cover page to explain 
every set of data that they gave. With or without evidence, the grievance process is a punitive measure. It's been clearly constructed to punish those who expect to be treated with even the most basic respect. A grievance is supposed to be a time when you say, here is what is wrong, and here is how I expect it to be resolved. The State Department of Education has given our teachers none of that. They've said, hey, if you grieve it, you can take the school-wide score and that is all. Even though the teacher's evidence is there, their documentation is there. Teachers I talk to also don't want to put extra work on their colleagues. They feel like it would be um, unreasonable to ask all of those scorers to come back and score all those pieces because there are a lot of them that weren't scored. They feel like it's unreasonable at the beginning of the year to ask that. They still would like their work to be graded, but they understand it's unreasonable. They feel that it would be completely reasonable to average the scores of those collections that were scored. There's nothing that absolutely proves that any teacher error actually caused any of this. There's nothing in their collections that I've seen. Their collections are there, except for some that were there and then later weren't, which is also no fault of theirs. So it would be reasonable to grade the ones or to average the ones that have been scored and to leave out the one that for whatever reason the State Department did not score. And I want to mention something that occurred at one school. Four kindergarten teachers used the exact same worksheet, or set of worksheets rather, to score their students. They all turned in the exact same kind of evaluation. So they all used the same tool. Every one of them had a different collection that was not scored. So for one, their math was not scored. For one, their language was not scored. And they can't find any rhyme or reason to why when everything looks the same. It doesn't make sense. And it looks to me like this process has always been set up to fail. Our legislators, our state board, our State Department of Education expect teachers to be accomplished professionals, and they are. The expectation that they are also flawless in everything they do is as absurd as this process is absurd. We can't let our Department of Education keep telling us that once again, their statewide failure of their systems is the fault of our teachers. And at some point, we have to call it like we see it. Madam Chair, um, I would like to say two more sentences after Natasha's presentation, if possible. OK. I'll go ahead and call her up now. Thank you. Ms. Patchen, as you're coming up, let me clarify that Ms. Patchen, good evening, is here at Ms. Owen's request to present some beneficial information to this board. She is not speaking in public forum, but she is here at the board member's request to present this information so that you can see for yourself what the kindergarten teachers are referring to. So Ms. Patchett, welcome. Thank you. My name is Natasha Patchen, and I am a kindergarten teacher. I would like to give you some information about the kindergarten portfolio. Nearly one year ago, I came before this board to express my concerns about the kindergarten portfolio. In that speech, I stated that I was concerned about what this poorly designed and implemented portfolio would do to me. Well, now I know. My overall score is a four. When you break that down, I received a four, a five, and another five on three collections. On my fourth collection, I received a score of one. What could be wrong? I went to look. There were my self scores, but there was no score from a peer reviewer and there was no explanation as to why I received that one. So how am I supposed to fix the problem? 
These are the reasons that the State Department of Education said you could receive a score of one. No standard was identified. I identified my standard. No context form was submitted. I submitted all context forms. Multiple math standards were identified. I identified one math standard for each area. A different standard was referenced in the context form than shown in the student work. I used the same standard for the context form and the student work. Same student work was uploaded for different levels. I didn't do that. Teacher, ch teacher checklist was submitted. I did not use a checklist. Student sample was not viewable. My samples were clear and complete. While my collection was correctly submitted, I can understand how a teacher might have some problems submitting evidence. To upload my context forms and evidence, I had to have my 20-year-old computer-savvy son at my side telling me what to do. I had to go through a 10-step process, and I had to do it 24 times. I do not know how many steps were involved in the uploading of my picture evidence. My son did that with me looking over his shoulder. It would be so easy to make a mistake. And that is why the legislature made this a pilot year. Even if a teacher made a mistake, why not thoroughly explain what was wrong and give some kind of credit other than just assigning a one to the collection? This portfolio is fraught with problems. What about teachers who must deal with some challenging life situation during the portfolio process? At my school, two teachers faced such a challenge. One teacher took a leave of absence to be with her dying father. Another teacher completed her portfolio even while she was staring down brain surgery for her daughter. She had issues with her portfolio. How is the State Department going to handle those types of situations? In my speech last year, I noted that it seemed the State Department of Education wanted us to fail. Why would they leave a portfolio collection unscored with no feedback? Why would they not investigate our claims? The State Department of Education is holding fast to their accusations that teachers have submitted incorrectly. This problem is far too widespread to ignore it. The State Department of Education recently posted that 78% of teachers were scored a three, four, or five. Is that supposed to keep those of us that were affected placated? We were scored inaccurately or not at all. We want to be taken seriously and we want this fixed. I have been told that I can grieve the process. If I grieve this score, the state will vacate my scores and I will have to take my pre-selected school-wide score, which, like all teachers, is selected by taking the very best guess as to which subject score my school will do best on before the test is even taken. It is like throwing a dart at a moving target. I may end up with an even lower score. Now, we are told that we are, will be doing a new portfolio on a new data collecting platform. We have not had any training on it. We have not even seen it. So once again, we will be training as we fly on a broken down portfolio plane. I ask you to please let us do this on school time. From this point, all of our PLC sessions, all of our district learning session days need to be focused on this new portfolio. We do not need to be spending our precious family time doing this all over again. And once again, we will need to ask the legislature to make this a pilot year. We have no faith in our State Department of Education, and we are rapidly losing faith in our elected leaders who support this fiasco. Here are three solutions, though I do not know who can enact them, as there is plenty of finger pointing going around. End this mess. Student data should never be attached to a teacher evaluation. There are too many things that are out of our control, and that would be the topic of a five minute or longer speech. Give teachers their score based on what was scored correctly. Investigate the scores with issues, though that would undoubtedly take even more time and money in this failed system. Last year I said I was weary. 
I was weary of the words rigorous and robust. I would like to introduce three new words, relevant, realistic, and respect worthy. Our, our students still deserve a developmentally appropriate curriculum and teachers deserve a well thought out, well tested, fair, and accurately scored growth measure. Now, I have my full portfolio here and it's up on the screen or can be put, oh, it is up on the screen. Um, if you would care to look at it or ask questions or have me walk you through that. I, th I think if you could walk us through a little bit like you did with me, that would be helpful. Okay, so this is the operations and algebraic thinking that I got a score of one on. If you look at my emergent student, and you'll need to slide down, you'll see that I got a score of one. You'll see my name at the top and three circles. Those three circles indicate the three, and there's actually five, but you can't see them all, um, standards. You will also notice beside my name at the top, there are no circles beside that. That means, as far as I can tell, no one else scored my portfolio. It's just my score. Um, if we could please go to the evidence now. Here you see my context form. It states the domain, it states the um, standard. That standard is the same standard you saw on the other page and it was circled or it had that circle with the one. If you go down the page, you'll see all the things that I had to write to justify my score for the student uh, evidence that you'll see next. If you'll please turn to my student evidence. Okay, this is a student that is below average at the beginning of the year. You'll notice I did not name the student. We were told to keep student identity strictly confidential. So we ne never ever put a student's name on it. They're identified by emergent, proficient, and advanced, and point A and then point B later in the year. So this student was trying to do this math concept. Does anyone need me to explain this math concept? Okay. Then let's go to point B, please. Can I just ask you really quickly, Natasha? Yeah. Um, when was that evidence collected? We, because I think that shows for me just the whole process itself is developmentally inappropriate and has no, um, you know, if you have a student that's emerging, um, that's gonna be normal for to have kids walk in your kindergarten classroom that don't, that don't know all these. And so I think the amount of time that you're showing us that this takes to present some evidence to a mythical person that I don't actually, I'll get to that in a minute, believe scored all of these um, portfolios is a disservice to the children when you could be spending your your time focusing your instruction and tailoring your instruction to what what their specific needs are. I mean, it just, it is it's an, crazy to me. <laughs> it is an absolute disservice to our children. We are spending an inordinate amount of time gathering and collecting data so that we look good. I mean, the bottom line is I want a five. I want to show that I'm a good teacher. So yes, we spend a lot of time gathering and collecting data. So, um, I asked when it, point, okay, point so A it starts, and point B. You asked when it started. I'm not going to start it tomorrow, but the next time they come in, I'm going to have to take a stab in the dark as to what the State Department of Education wants to see and I'm going to start collecting all kinds of data. I'm gonna collect data on counting. I'm going to collect data, data on adding and subtracting. I'm going to collect data on writing. And I'm going to do that as soon as I can because the sooner I can gather that data, then I can work like a busy beaver and my children can work. And then in March or February, when I go and get that point B, then I will be getting more data so that I have a, a large range that shows that I took these children that couldn't hold a pencil and now they're holding a pencil and they're struggling to write a sentence. And I will, that, just, 
Yeah, and I'll just, the only other thing I'll add is um, there is some research being done that looks at the fact that this type of process and procedure is harmful to kids' self-efficacy and success in school because what we're seeing is that um, from qualitative data from kindergarten teachers where this has been in place in other states, for example, there was a study in Michigan that um, the teachers reported seeing a decrease in their students' self-efficacy and autonomy because the teachers are required to collect so much of this data for children that maybe have never been in a formal educational setting. Um, and so they begin to think and believe that they fail before they've even had an opportunity to learn. Exactly. Okay, so now what you're looking at is the point B of that emergence, emergent student. And you'll, again, see my name, but no score beside it that shows that, that a peer reviewer scored it. You'll see that I received a five because my student grew from not knowing how to do this skill at all to now being quite effective at it. Now let's look at the evidence. Again, there's, sorry, there's the context form that justifies why I gave the student the score that I gave the student. And, and that took at least 24 hours of my at-home personal time. So I essentially robbed my family of myself and, and I didn't get to spend that time with my family. Let's go to the next slide, please. So as you can see, it's considerably harder, um, and that student did quite well. They missed one, but that still was an acceptable number to miss. Um, does anyone have any questions on that slide? Okay. Uh, do you want to get up here? Uh, okay. that when the State Department came, they said that one could have been because it was two different types of forms. She didn't use the same form. But another kindergarten teacher, because I spoke with Dr. Drummond that was going to kill me, that um, I've been talking with kindergarten teachers. Well, a kindergarten teacher had something similar to this, had the same documents, and still scored a one. So that's what's challenging about that. Okay, I think it might be helpful, if you're still awake and with me, to look at where I scored, um, where I got scored and where I had a peer reviewer. We're not going to go and look at the proficient and advanced. It's basically the same kind of information, but I think it will help you to understand this process if you see one that was scored. So can you get me to my um, accounting and cardinality, please? While they're looking that up, I'll just add, um, I, from my understanding, um, there was a person that was a, a peer reviewer that reviewed some of, some of the portfolios. They reviewed their portion. They asked the state, um, you know, they completed what they were given. They asked for more to review, and they were told no, which I found strange. And then the person was subsequently told later, um, and this is a teacher in Knox County, that they had not reviewed enough portfolios to get the stipend that um, the peer reviewers were being paid. So I just, I have some real concerns about, um, I guess the truth is relevant for our Department of Education. Before you go on, Natasha, I think the other night, which I have studied and thought about for days now, we were told that some of the problems with the teachers were that they mismatched students, and I just don't believe that's possible. But I don't even understand beyond that how you could determine that you've mismatched a student if students aren't identified. How would the state know that it was a mismatched student if there's no identification for the students? And then another question that I had was, if you're gonna show growth, you can't just hand that student that first paper you did at the first of the year. I mean, if this student's advanced to the paper you just showed us and you're trying to show growth, why would you limit it to that first paper you introduced the first day they were in kindergarten? So mismatching, I would think, I don't know. I just think you would have to use a different 
thing to show true growth or you're limiting how much they grew in your evidence collected. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, um, okay. So now we're actually going to look at a, I was going to have you look at my map, but um, my colleague has said that we're going to look at my uh, language arts. And this might be a good thing because then you can see how developmentally inappropriate this is. Okay, so now we're looking at the language art scores, and you can see there is someone ha that has rated my portfolio. You see the PR, which means peer reviewer, and you see the NP, which of course stands for me. If you could slide that down, please. So I picked option C, and you can see my score, you can see the peer reviewer's score. And um, and then you can see, our, I guess, what would be our average of that score. We, we I, I, oh, I know why there's three. There are three different circles filled in there because I had to cover in one portfolio collection three different objectives, and it was grueling. Does anyone have questions on this part? I do. Um, so when we're looking at, at the, the PR there, the, I assume that's primary rater, none of your others had that rater or that number, right? Exactly. So the one that you had a five and the one that you had a one, neither one shows a rater. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, now I think we should look at the evidence. And again, I believe this is a emergent student. Okay, so at, you can see my context form. And I had to describe each of the three standards. And if you slide it down, okay, so here is where I now justify my score. And teachers struggled over this. I, I remember having several conversations over the phone late at night with peers saying, well, how are we going to score this? Because the rubric says one thing, but our it didn't align up with how our kids were working. And if you, if we had time, we could look through all of this, but you know, the, the time is getting late, so I think we should move on to look at the evidence. I'd like to point out to the board too that there, there's no way. Debbie, hit first, go to first tag. Go, go to more information. Go down, 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 down. Bam. Okay. There's so, no way that I, I or any of us could have run her slideshow while she's talking because it is unwieldy to go from screen to screen and figure out where all of the information is. The platform is incredibly difficult. Thankfully, Thankfully, we have an expert back here who has also done the portfolio, who is also willing to come. And I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. So Debbie, Debbie can get through this because she has spent a year digging through it. It's amazingly, ridiculously difficult. And I hope every, everyone is seeing the back and forth and back and forth that a teacher has to do to even look and see that the standard and the explanation and the student work all lines up. And notice that all of these have, whether the State Department agrees or not. Okay, so this is my emerging student at the beginning of the year. I asked them to draw, well, I read them a story first, an informational story that gave facts about space, and I asked them to draw a picture and write any words they could. Well, they couldn't write any words, but they said, hey, I've drawn a sun. And so I wrote the word sun in the middle of that evidence. Now, if you look to the right-hand side, you see level one criteria, and that states why it's a level one, and if Debbie goes down further, you get my feedback. My feedback on this is student wrote no words. That's it. That's the feedback that I got. Even though I had to combine 
three objectives. Now, let's close this and go look at this same emergent student later in the year. Slide it down, please. Okay, so you'll see that I gave myself a three, my peer reviewer gave myself a, me a three on the um, applies student now, uh, knowledge of phonics. That's how well they can write words in kindergarten. And then I got a five, and my, or I gave myself a five, and the peer reviewer gave me a five on the ob objective or standard of, of t can the student identify the main topic and retell something about that main topic. And then I got a four on uses combination of drawing and dictation and writing to um, describe the story. Now I'll tell you one of the reasons I got a four is my students did not write a concluding sentence. Yes, in kindergarten, they were expected to write a concluding sentence. Here is my context form, which describes and justifies why I gave the scores that I did. Debbie, if you will go to the first tag, down toward the bottom, thank you. Now, this is what the student was able to do after a lot of pain and a lot of work and a lot of inappropriate uh, time spent. Some of the words I gave them, there was not really any way they could spell star because star has an R controlled vowel and they haven't got there yet. Um, they didn't know how to spell the word when because when has an H in it and kindergartners don't know that yet. If you look at the word explode at the very, the very last word, they spelled it with an X and they used appropriate letter sound relationships to finish the word explode. However, there were certain kinds of words that I had to have to get a score of five and I didn't have those mainly because they didn't apply themselves to that particular story. I would have had to say, hey, honey, why don't you write the word was in there and that will get me some bonus points. But that really doesn't make sense for a child to do that. Because you have to have CVCs, right? Not you have to have, CVC you have to have consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, vowel blends, uh, consonant blends, and maybe a few other things, but I, I'd have to have the whole rubric there because it's, it's overwhelming to me, and it is to the children. Now you'll see that I got a comment here. The student has topic and D, three details for a level four. Debbie, can you slide? Oh, oh, okay. And if you look over on the left-hand side, you can see little blue arrows. So if she touches each of those blue arrows, a different comment will show up. Now, if you think back to the score that I got a one and there was no peer reviewer, there are also no comments because I don't believe they looked at my portfolio. Why would you give me a score of one and not make some comment as to why? Um, I think I have thoroughly explained, I hope I have thoroughly explained this to you all. Um, if you would like to see more, I'm more than willing to show you, but. Um, do you have any questions? I don't see any, Natasha, and I think everybody's turned off their lights um, for comments, so we'll go back to Ms. Owen. She has to make a couple of statements, but I appreciate you being so transparent, and I appreciate the board's indulgence in letting her show you this, but I do think it's important to see, it's one thing to hear, well, such and such percent didn't score to one, but all these others scored three, fours, and fives. But it has been, and I appreciate all the work you've done too, Ms. Owen, on it, but it, we have got to address this issue at multiple levels. So thank you very much for being willing to come tonight, Natasha, and all the kindergarten teachers that came and supported you. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Oh, Carrie, your light's back.
your light's on now. Did you want to say something? Ms. Owen, can you let Ms. Go, go ahead. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Debbie. We appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, um, besides the misscoring, the, the, whole, the whole concept is beyond reasonable. I have no appropriate words for this because there are no appropriate words for this. Nothing's appropriate about the situation our Department of Education has repeatedly put teachers in. So I would like to call on our director of schools and this board to let our legislators, the Department of Education and our governor know that we have no confidence in this portfolio process in the 10 ready testing or in our state Department of Education as a whole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you all. I, uh, I don't, um, I don't disagree with anything that has been said. I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, so now we're uh, okay. What are we going to? What can we do about this? You know, um, as I've had to painfully tell. Um, the kindergarten teachers I've seen these last few days, and I ha I've been in probably six of my schools in the, in the last three days, and not one that's got kindergarten in it hasn't, I haven't been bombarded. And, but that's a good thing, because we need to be educated to this. So that, that, that's a very good thing that this has happened. Um, I need to uh, apologize to Dr. Drummond not giving you more heads up on this. I just got got the copy of, of um, Pat Mashburn's email and the copy from Michael Shepard uh, with the Professional Educators of Tennessee. Am I correct? That's the other union that represents Tennessee or, I mean, represents educators? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Drummond, the um, the the letter from uh, uh, from or the email from uh, Ms. Mashburn. Um, how are you, Pat? <laughs> I know you guys have been dying on this too, and I know too that this wasn't an issue that you created. Uh, absolutely, let me just say that up front. This is. Um, you, uh, in many ways, are about as victimized as the as everybody else is because none of us here made this happen or wanted this to happen. Um, if I could just read this, and let me ask you, um, did this go out to all kindergarten teachers? If if I if I could please. Thank you, Miss Ashburn. Friday of last week, August 3rd, uh, Darlene Miller made a phone call to Keeley Potter at the state level who's in charge of portfolio. And our response was we, we had all these concerns from the kindergarten and early grade, other early grades. And their response was you can waive the local grievance and 14 people had already filed a local grievance about their scores and they sent a form called a portfolio submission error notification process. So we attached that to, and I personally sent an email out to each kindergarten person who had filed a local grievance with this information. So this state information allows them to directly respond to the state what their concern is about their portfolio submission if there's an error at hand versus filing for a local grievance because the local folks in Knox County did not score their work. Right, okay. And I think had we had this on the upswing, mm -hmm. we had to ask for it. And probably it had not been created until when we asked for it late Friday afternoon. Okay. This was not to our knowledge until Darlene called and they sent this, this information. So I attached this to every person who had filed a grievance. 
she sent it out to every person on her listserv that she supervises. They should have gotten that information Friday evening. Uh, they who should have gotten that I'm information? I'm talking about your early grades folks, all your pre-K pre and K. Uh, okay. Um, from Darlene, you're saying, yes. from Ms. Miller. Yes. Uh, the teachers should have gotten it directly. Yes. If they were one of the 14 that had already filed a grievance? Not necessarily. Just everyone in those grade levels received this information. Received the information that I'm looking at uh, from the email that, that you sent Tuesday afternoon um, to this, this one particular teacher. I, and I sent it to the 14 people who had filed a grievance to make sure they got the same information one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, okay. I didn't want any oversight. Okay. Um, Natasha, did you have a comment about that? I did get that email. The problem being is that when I read through that, it still claims, wants to claim that I am at fault. I am not at fault. I get that. I, so I get I, that. I can't, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to lie and say, yep, I made a mistake when I did not I make a mistake. Okay. Now, this in, uh, information from this Michael Shepard, which, uh, according to Dr. Drummond, had she, you had not seen it. Um, so, we don't even know if this is correct about a technical error. You've got till October 1st before, when you get your school scores to make your decision. And you have until October 1st to file this new form, according to the state. Okay, it says if you wish no later than October for her. Uh, you can file by, by October 1st. Okay. So, yes. it looks like this, this letter from Michael Shepard is stating, though, is this correct? That if they want to add a letter to it stating that they're one. And... If this form doesn't allow you to do that, I would recommend that they contact Keeley Potter directly via email at the state level. If the form that... If they can't submit what they wish to submit to be looked at, then I would recommend that they email P Keeley Potter. All right. So is, is the statement, at, to your knowledge, because I, I know you're getting some of this just like... We are. Um, if you wish to keep your portfolio scores but would like documentation added to your record stating that the ones you received were due to a technical error versus a determination of lack of growth, you may request that the notification letter you received from the state DOE be added to your evaluation file. Is that correct? I can't speak for what his source is. I'm sorry. All right. And, and I understand that. But this whole thing speaks to the total mass confusion that, that, um, that, has, that has occurred. Uh, so do you have a, you do point, not point, know the point, point of order, Madam Chair. We have been talking about this for going on an hour now. The, the, it is abundantly clear this is an absolute absurdity. We've been talking about evaluations in general since TVAS came in. And we, we keep railing on it, we keep railing on it. We can beat the details of this thing to death all night long. It's absurd. It's completely absurd. It's driving teachers crazy. And this isn't, I want us to get to a point where we're doing something. And, and that's what I'm trying to do here, is trying to determine, in fact, what is the most recent information that our kindergarten teachers have even been sent? Because clearly I'm looking at things here that teachers, kindergarten teachers in our audience, they're shaking their heads. They don't even know. So I am trying to look for commonality, because you're right, it, it's, it's horrible, Ms. it's Hill, horrendous. Let me just add this to the mess, because um, I talked with Representative Smith last night after he'd spent all day in the summer study grilling 
the DOE, and here's two bits of information that probably you all don't have that I have that I want to share with you. These are, and by far, by all means, it is not sufficient, but he, there is an attempt. These were all the things we got the department to agree to today. One, any portfolio with an automatic one can submit proof that no standards are mismatched and the DOE will rescore the portfolio and update a teacher evaluation. Two, additionally, any teacher that would have been tenure eligible but this year's score would make them ineligible can ignore this year's score and the next score can be used as their third year to grain tenure. So again, to your point and to your point, we just, this just keeps rolling along while these teachers out here have no idea they're starting a new year with 20 students that don't know how to go to the bathroom or tie their shoes and they're dealing with all of this and then the State Department, thank you Mr. Norman for your charge on all of this, is now to decided to do a new a portfolio new, yes, and they have to yes. learn how to upload all of that evidence again on a new platform. I mean, I don't know what else we can say and that's to your point, Mr. Norman, that we've been talking about this for a long time. So we'll let Ms. Hill finish. Jennifer, Ms. your lights back on? Yeah, I just want to ask you a question. Okay, and then Ms. One more question, I'll be quiet. And then Ms. Stetherich has a question and then you've got two sentences. Ms. Owen, right? Okay, go Ms. Hill. So you, you teachers, if I may, that are sitting out here, were you aware of what Ms. Bounds said? Did you know that that had been determined? I see some. Okay, but I'm talking about the, the, the comment about last year. You did receive this. All right. Oh, yes. From Loudoun Ms. County. Ms. All right. Thank you. Ms. Coatney, Ms. Um, if you're going to speak directly, which I'm not sure what that rules are, then she's going to have to have names to go into the record of the teachers that are answering your questions. I appreciate that. That's okay. I'm hearing you. Okay. So, Ms. Dethridge. <laughs> Sorry, Gloria. Your poor they microphone. <laughs> We're ready to do board my, forum. My question, remember when you were, we were in Nashville and you were with the kindergarten teachers and this was this discussion for this portfolio. Is this the same thing that we've been complaining about for the last two years and we're still having teachers to go to Nashville to discuss this same portfolio? Because I remember when you were well, there before. Right, well what happened was we piloted it and then the DOE put their spin on it last year and so while technically it is the portfolio that was voted on by the legislators, what caused a lot of these problems, in my opinion, was that they did not use Knox County's that was teacher driven, mm -hmm. teacher friendly, that was developed by us as a pilot program. That it was sent to the Department of Ed, they compressed objectives, they made it super rigorous, totally developmentally inappropriate, which is why they've said they'll go back this year and redo it. And then they changed the way it's uploaded. Okay. So you're right to some extent, except the DOE messed with it and they've created this huge fiasco so throughout the we, state. when we respond according to what, um, I guess, uh, Jennifer. Jennifer is gonna re re uh, re request we need to go back and respond to what we submitted the first time that was teacher driven and, send right. and, and, and try to go from there and get them to look at what we did the first time and use that as a way of, of, of changing the portfolio to better fit what is best for our teachers. That's okay, thank you. Ms. Owen, can you wrap us up here yes. in two sentences? Um, I can make a motion. Um, okay. I'd like to make a motion for our chair and our director of schools to draft a strong letter to our legislative delegation, our Department of Education and the governor, expressing that we have no confidence in the portfolio process, the 10 ready test or our Department of Education. 
and to follow the intent of the recent letter that was drafted by the superintendents in um, Shelby County and Metro Nashville to say that they believed that a pause needed to be placed on, on the um, 10 ready test specifically, but I would add to it a portfolio process and just pause until we have a new governor in place who can find a way to get a handle on our Department of Education. Second. However, that needs to be said okay. in your letter and, so we, and for you guys to draft that. Would you read? So we have a motion by Ms. Owen, seconded. <laughs> Maybe you just repeat it, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Okay. And then Maybe we'll have I'll discussion. Leave out the intent part. A motion for our chair and our director of schools to draft a strong letter to our legislative delegation, our Department of Education, and our governor expressing that we have no confidence in the portfolio process, the 10 ready test, or our entire Tennessee Department of Education. Okay. Now we've got more lights on. So I think it was Miss Fugit, then Miss Etheridge, and then you, Mr. Norman. Oh, hers is off. What? Amber seconded it, yes. yes. So we have a motion and a second, and Ms. Fugit can speak in discussion, and then Mr. Norman Thank before you. we vote. Madam Chair, my only, uh, I guess, point of order question would be, um, I think it would be wise for the board to see the letter and vote to approve to send that letter as a board um, just so that it's on the record that the board actually saw the letter and agreed to all the language in the board. We do, we do that with every other resolution we've ever sent. So I, I don't have a problem with her um, suggesting that you draft a letter, but I think before it goes, it should come back before a, the board to be voted on because that's the way we've done those kind of things before. Okay, Mr. Norman. Uh, and then I would ask the maker of the motion to, for a friendly amendment to include uh, the team evaluation system in general on, in the letter. Are you referring to TVOS or team? Team and team? team. Okay, team. Okay, that is a friendly motion. Miss, I guess it's back to you, Miss Owen. What? Will that, will that amendment be, if that's acceptable to the board, I would, that'd be fine. You decide, you and then I have to decide. Say, yeah. It's fine with me. Do you want to accept it? Then Ms. Nor then Ms. Roundtree to, has to second to, it. Do we all need to sign the letter too? I'd be fine with that too. Okay, so, so you're, sure. you're accepting the friendly amendment. Yes. You're seconding yes, it. Yes, I'm seconding. Now we're back to, yes. okay. Now we're voting. Now we're voting on us drafting the letter. And do we need another motion or, because we heard Ms. Fugit's comments or just Mr. Dupler, do we need to be specific as to well, Ms. Coatney send it out I and get board approval, get each members, or does that need to be a public record open? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think that, that Ms. Owen has, has a, it's my understanding, accepted the two friendly amendments, one for the, for the team rubric and, and one to have this, make this a draft. To be to be approved by all board members, is that correct, Miss Owen? I don't think that was Miss Fugitz was My made in the form was of just a friendly that we amendment. To approve it, I think. Yeah, I, I did not make a friendly amendment. I just said that protocol is that we typically don't let the board chair and superintendent draft a letter on behalf of the board without it coming back to the board for a vote. I think that's risky water okay. to get into. Well, so that was more of a point of order. I think I, I can support a voting on a motion to tell them to draft something. I just, I guess my friendly amendment is that they not send it prior to the board approval. Right. Are you, do we need to meet to approve it or can we approve it individually? I think as a matter of sunshine, it should probably be in public, Mr. Dupler. So we would need to have a special called meeting just for that or Wait till the do it in September and let the new people do vote it on in it in September. But that's kind of time sensitive since Nashville and Metro. I mean, so 
I don't know if we need. Ms. Hill, do you have a comment on that? I'm, uh, I'm wondering at this point, um, it might not be more timely to see if we could not get, get the board to approve a motion to, um, to, draft, to send a letter merely stating that we uh, are, are to the effect we are strongly opposed to this portfolio, to the, to the results, uh, that it, it needs to be hold harmless, it needs to have a pause on it, whatever we want to throw in at this point, isolate it to this most immediate and timely uh, concern, which is the portfolio and then perhaps at our next meeting we could consider something else that includes some of the other things that Ms. Owens originally, originally stated because this is so time sensitive. I, I guess that would go back to Ms. Owens. I hear what you're saying, but we still have the problem with setting proto protocol for the future. Now we directed the superintendent to write a strong letter, which none of the board had any problem with. In this case, Ms. Owens is asking that it be the board included in that, which I think sends a stronger statement. But to Ms. Owens, I mean, to Ms. Hugo's point, we need, I mean, I don't mind calling a special call meeting and coming in, but I don't know how the rest of the board feels about coming back to read a letter tomorrow or the next day and sign it. So I don't know, that's the board's will. I have, I'm retired, I can come in. <laughs> Ms. Fuga, thank you again. I am really not trying to not, make, make this difficult. I'm just saying you are setting a precedent I understand. That, if, that if a letter goes out under the authority of the board without the board voting to approve that letter, that's a slippery slope. I have no problem with a called meeting. I'm the elected representative till the end of August. I can come back, but I think everything that was in that motion makes it a little more likely that we might not all agree with everything in it. That was, that's my concern. Okay, so. Uh, Madam Ms. Chair. Well, Ms. Fugit's correct. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're calling for a letter and you don't have the exact wording at this point, the board will have to have some type of meeting, presumably a special called meeting, which would have to have at least two days notice and, and, then, and then agree on the letter. Uh, alternatively, um, you know, the motion could be uh, amended or substituted to, to do what Ms. Hill suggests, which is just simply uh, send a sentence or two to the to the to the state board and then do something at a later date Okay, thank you. I guess we'll let Ms. Horn speak to this and then mr. Norman and then I think that a more focused letter as Ms. Hill has suggested would be beneficial because I think when you pile on too many things it's ignored. So I think if we want to make a statement on the kindergarten portfolio that it should be targeted to that and if we want to entertain other um, other broader issues later on down the road we can do that. But I think that we it carries more weight if it's focused and not all over the board because when you make blanket statements that are not focused I don't think that it will be um, will be received with as much um, with the, with the weight that it, credibility, thank you, Ms. Hill, that it would if it's focused on one issue. Okay, Mr. Norman. Yeah, and I agree. I can see this, this could get too broad. So the important point is the portfolio. That's important right now. And so I'll withdraw that part of the friendly amendment. But I would like to see the whole evaluation system. That, that's, that's the source of the portfolio. The portfolio is born out of the whole mess of the evaluation system. So that's what we need to get to. Okay. I see no lights on, but we need, Ms. Owen, do you want to make a substitute motion after hearing your colleagues speak to this and zeroing in on the portfolio and maybe it seemed we 
I included the 10 ready test because Shelby County and Metro Nashville had already strongly opposed that and they had specifically said they have no confidence in 10 ready. Um, I could take out 10 ready if we need to and do that separately some other time. Um, I do want to include our Department of Education. I think that is important. I think that's where the failure is. Really, we don't even have to say portfolio because every one of these huge fiascos that we have experienced that has impacted our teachers, that's impacted our students, that's impacted our ability to our ability to have class and to learn has been a direct result of a failure of the Department of Education. So I, that, I believe, needs to urgently be in there. Um, so if I need to restate the motion, I can say that it is a motion for our chair and the superintendent to draft a strong letter to our legislative delegates, our Department of Education, and our governor expressing that we have no confidence in the portfolio process or our Department of Education. Okay. Mr. Dubler, if if it just states the motion primarily, is there the same slippery slope that you're talking about? If it's just what's in the motion that we send and the board agrees to, is that satisfactory? I'm, I'm thinking Ms. it needs some introduction, and you know, I'm not thinking that they're going to come out with a lot of other things, Mr. Dubler. If if they drafted this into a formal letter and each board member saw that letter without discussion or change and they had no objection. Could it be sent that way or would we still have to meet? I think we still need a special call. I'll let him roll, but I think we need a special uh, I call. Mean, but, uh, yes, Ms. Owen, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I mean, there would still be some type of deliberation there, which would have to be sunshine. Yeah. So if you're looking at Today is Wednesday, having it ready by Friday, then a special called meeting. In that case, throw in Monday. some more mean words. <laughs> what? Okay. So I'm sorry, what, Miss? I was listening to Miss Cup. I'm sorry, I was saying throw in some more, some more angry words if we have a little more time. <laughs> okay. So what is the will of this for your motion? As you stated, I guess we could go ahead and vote on that. I don't see any other discussion. I second the new motion. Okay. Okay. So Ms. Hill seconded Ms. Owen's motion. I don't think you can second it. What? Yes. Motion for our chair and the superintendent to draft a strong letter to our legislative delegation, our Department of Education, and the governor expressing that we have no confidence in the portfolio process or our Department of Education. Was that a substitute or an amendment? I, I, if I'm supposed to second, I think she I withdrew that. her motion, oh, made a substitute. Okay. Just let's call it that that's what yes. she did. I just read it. Okay. And you're seconding it. Oh, Ms. Hill seconded it. Yes. So you don't have to. Is pre-K also doing this portfolio? Yes. yes. So yes. we need to be sure that we say the pre-K okay. through yes. K. Okay. Actually, well, I'm not okay. Sorry. Ready to vote? Yes. Oh, I've made this an impossible night for me. Okay, all in, all, do not put your light on, Ms. Speaker. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. All opposed? No. No, I'm sorry, not unanimously. Ms. Fugit voted no. May I explain why? I just yes. can't throw a whole Department of Education under the bus, that's like throwing all of Knox County schools under the bus when there's part of what they do we don't agree with. That's why. It's a very valid point. And we do have a newly, well, we will have a newly elected governor who has, the ones I've talked to hope to make a change. So there's always hope. Okay, I think that's it except for board forum because- There's Ms. no public forum. No, so, so Ms. Roundtree, Ms. Deathridge, we'll start over there with you. Do you have anything for a board forum? <laughs> Just to say thank you for um, honoring uh, me and my family and 
the service I provided because I provided because of the love I have for the kids and education in Knox County. And I appreciate everyone that has supported us or supported me for the eight years. And I appreciate everything Knox County does. We, go, we do have things that we need to work on. I know there is a lot of things and challenges and I don't plan to go away, but I do plan to support this board and support Knox County Schools. But I just want to tell you how much I really appreciate everybody that take the time out to do what we do. Thank you. Ms. Ellen. Do we need to set a time to meet? Yes, Ms. Dupler um, mentioned that. I don't, I don't know that anybody has their calendars here. Do you all want to set a time right now or would you rather send in or have Terry send out a time and you all agree to it? Yeah, yeah the time the time does not have to be decided right now but I mean through through Miss Coatney I mean you, you know the board can come up with a time and then public notice it okay so we'll just direct Miss Coatney to come up with a time allowing for the two days public notice time for the superintendent to get it together and do it as soon as possible after that is that okay is that okay with everybody okay so Ms. Ellen. And I'd like to say that I appreciate those who have, who are outgoing from our board. It has been a lot of difficult work and many trying times on both sides of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all, of, all of that time, I know there were several years ago some five-hour meetings over and over and over, and you put in many, many, <laughs> many long, long hours, and we appreciate that very much. Thank you for your service. Mr. Norman. Agree. I thank you. Uh, thanks, Gloria, Amber, and Ms. Fugate for our, your service. It, it truly is, it's a much bigger job than what people realize. You know, you sort of say, well, you're on the school board. Oh, well, uh, they have no idea how much time, and we've been castigated a couple of times for how much, how much we're paid. I mean, my gosh, come on. Um, so anyway, and thanks uh, and God bless all our students and teachers this year. I hope this is the smartest and safest year we've ever had. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are too many people for me to thank, but I, I would be remiss um, if I didn't say just thank you to everyone who has helped um, lift me up and my family up along along this uh, journey. I'm sure most of you uh, remember. I started when I was pregnant with Teddy and you saw him here tonight and um, both of my boys have been through many board meetings and spent many nights at home with my husband Bart so I would be uh, very remiss if I didn't thank him. I know he left but he is super dad and super husband and he's really made this work of serving the community possible for me so and I've enjoyed the time I've put in and if you haven't seen the last of me I'm going to keep working and fighting for literacy and um, what's best for our kids and you'll probably see me on the other side of the podium as a parent but, um, I appreciate all the work that um, has been done here and I look forward to seeing great things to come thank you miss you get Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just say that um, as the daughter and granddaughter of educators, and I'm the first generation of my family not to become an educator, I have a great respect for the work people do. I don't have the patience to do it, and I admire those of you who have the willingness to serve, serve children in the classroom. What I have hoped to do over the last eight years is bring what I thought were my gifts and talents to help um, improve education for students in Knox County. Um, I've been active in schools for 21 years since my now 26 year old showed up at elementary school and kindergarten and it's been a it's been an interesting and wild ride. What I will say that I hope happens more than anything and I and I have disagreed with colleagues um, but I hope what the community learns and what our country needs desperately is for people to understand that people can be colleagues and have different points of view. And when we share those points of view, we actually inform one another's decisions and become a better community and a better board and a better country from that. The vitriol that is around so much and that uh, some of us have experienced, some of us have given to one another. In the past, I, I really appreciate how 
that has tamped down and I, I, I have become a better board member by listening to people that I didn't always agree with. I hope I have helped shape opinions of people who didn't always agree with me and I would just um, hope that the board continues to do that work and I cannot leave without saying a tremendous thank you to the central office staff. Um, for the eight years that I have served on the board, what is asked of you is unbelievable. We talk a lot about what's asked of our teachers, but people don't see what's asked of you. And the amount of work you do, the I, I'd say 100 hour weeks is the norm. Um, and that's when school's not in session. Um, and I just, the, the professionalism and the commitment and the, absolute love for children and making their lives better is why you do what you do. And I am forever grateful for having gotten to work with all of you and wish you much continued success. Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanna join with um, just wishing you all the best and I've enjoyed um, getting to know each one of you and I've learned a lot from each of you and um, thank you for making me feel welcome two years ago when I came onto the board and um, I appreciate your service and Tony's right people don't realize the time that we all put into this and that even when we disagree we all want the best for students. We just have different perspectives. And so um, I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to learn from one another. And I wish you all the best. And um, thank you again. We're coming to for all GSBA you. for fun now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll miss you at GSBA. Yeah, we'll just come for dinner. Yeah. And uh, eight years is a long time for those of you who've been on this board for eight years. I I'm a long time. So <laughs> kudos to you <laughs> for making it to the end. Gloria and Amber and Lynn, best to you, and I do hope we see you again. It's been good making new friends. Mr. McMillan. Yes, Ms. Horn, eight years is <laughs> quite a while for some of us, and, uh, well, hopefully more or less. Uh, I do want to say that, uh, of course, Amber, you've only been here four years, but uh, I think you've accomplished quite a bit in, in those years. You've been very, very involved. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate all that, you know, that you have done, all your contributions. Sometimes we've not always agreed on things, but that, that's part of it. And that brings me to Gloria and Lynn and I all came in together. And, uh, you know, I think over, over the, the years and, and over time, uh, we, we, we've gotten to know each other and, as Lynn said, appreciate the other one's perspective. You know, you can, you can agree to disagree, uh, and I think that's, that's what happened. I do think that, that, that all of you, um, I, I, I sort of mentioned it when I was talking about Amber, but I think, uh, Gloria and Lynn have made major contributions uh, in your time here. You've had a little bit longer than, than, than Amber has had, uh, and, but uh, I, I do appreciate the things that you brought to the board and, and uh, I've enjoyed working with you. And, and I will, to be honest, I'll miss you. <laughs> oh. Thank you. And you know, I meant to say this, has everybody had a chance? Um, did you want to, I started with Glory, I'm sorry. Did you want to say anything? On behalf of the students of Knox County, thank the three of you for your service. I know it means a lot to all of us. Okay, thank you. I meant to say this when I came back up here tonight after I read that litany of everything y'all had done. We have a lot of committees on the Board of Education. I started reading through those and I thought, oh my goodness, which is, <laughs> additional time served when Tony mentions about how long it takes, I mean, how much work it is because there's all those committees that you serve on in addition to um, the meetings and the schools and the phone calls and the emails and everything. So all three of you are gonna be missed very much and um, we just look forward to seeing you in the future and good things and if I miss- Now we can go out to dinner, not sunshine. <laughs> 
Okay, if I have a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. I don't. Ms. Fugate, you may want to wait to the end of the month on that, please. Okay. I know. I know. But <laughs> I, I, other than the call meeting to vote on the letter, there's nothing else for me to vote on. <laughs> okay. So I have a motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. This meeting's adjourned.